Okay. Go for it. So, uh, yes, I am Brian Hoover. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. Um, test software architect at Samsung SDIA, where we uh, test automotive batteries. Uh, I'm a certified LabVIEW architect and a champion, and you'll see me on the forums as Hoova in the, the NI and, and LAVA, where I'm trying to help out and answer questions. Uh, and this is a presentation on code reviews and VI Analyzer. So before I get started, uh, I really wanted to highlight um, how big of a topic this really is. Um, I started researching it and realizing that this is going to go into a lot of things that um, just can't simply be covered in a one hour presentation. And most of my presentations are that way. Most of them are very high level and they just touch on a couple of things. And then if you want to know more, you can go and learn about any of those one topics. But I realized in doing this that the topics are so broad that I'm going to put in uh, my own slide saying, just so you know, there's going to be a lot of things that we're just going to gloss over. There's going to be like certain slides that it's a one slide thing that could be a topic that we talk about for an hour or you could even focus your entire professional career around. So um, here's just a dozen of the topics that I kind of said we're going to talk about and there's just simply not enough time to go into each in depth. Um, the faster that I can get through the slides, the more time we can spend on demos. Um, but to be honest, uh, you know, I'm not doing anything after this one hour presentation is over. So if you have questions, we can stick around if we don't get to answer them. Or if you have other things you want to talk about, that's fine too. Okay, so code reviews. Why even do them? Um, I wanted this to be one of the first slides in here uh, just because we we want to we want to see the benefits of code reviews and and what's the purpose of them because uh, you know a lot of managers and a lot of um, uh, those that are that are into the cost analysis really want to see is there a benefit to doing code reviews and is that benefit worth all the effort that goes into them and so um, I, I pulled a couple of resources from uh, various websites. And uh, I mean, I, I think that the graph really says it all. And it's and even if it's not, you know, exact numbers, it's very true. As you start your initial coding development, you're going to have a lot of bugs that you're kind of writing. And that's just because, you know, there are defects introduced for various reasons or issues. And as time goes on, hopefully you introduce less and less bugs into the system. And as time goes on, you get rid of more and more bugs. You know, you find them, you fix them and all that. But the cost of fixing them really goes up exponentially. Um, imagine, you know, if I find a bug in my code when I'm writing it, it's very easy to fix. I just fix it. There it is. It's done. If you have to fix a code bug when, you know, it's on a piece of hardware that's in a million cars, holy cow, that's a very big undertaking. It's, they're already out in the system. They're out in the world. How do, you, how do you get those things back? How do you update the software on them? How do you go about the whole, you know, is there a recall? Is there a replacement? Is there warranties? It's all these major headaches. And so really one of the benefits of code review is we can push those to the left. We can kind of find these problems earlier on. And even if we only find a couple of issues that we fix during that coding uh, code review or analysis, we're going to have that benefit of, well, those one or two bugs didn't get found later on. And, and, and that's going to make up for it. So if you spend time doing code reviews right and you have this process in place and you do things, um, the benefits aren't going to be immediately apparent. You're going to say, well, I could have fixed that. That wasn't that big a deal. Yes, but the fact that it was fixed now and not during functional testing or not during the system testing or not during the release cycle, that's where some of the major um, benefits are going to come from. So I just put up a couple of things saying it makes more well-rounded developers, it makes more consistent code, it encourages team collaboration, um, and it helps find bugs that um, are, are found earlier in the release cycle. And uh, just a couple of other things I wanted to mention is that code reviews in LabVIEW are something that's not adopted as early on as other programming disciplines. Um, when we think about LabVIEW programmers, they're generally engineers first and then programmers second. Not always the case, but as a result, a lot of our programming disciplines aren't as well done as other languages. So for instance, uh, source code control, that's something that LabVIEW really didn't take seriously nearly as, as early on in its life cycle as uh, other programming languages. Virtual machine usage, continuous integration, configuration management, 
these are all things that us lab view programmers kind of just say well we'll you know maybe we'll be interested in it but we don't have a full process in place and i think part of that just comes back to the fact that we're scientists and we're engineers and um that's the kind of thing that that we're interested in and the coding disciplines is something that we're doing less often oh and that's a great question luis just had um who do code reviews as part of your regular development process um was that meant to be uh pushed out to everyone if so answer in the chat oh yep and uh, uh chime in on you know do you do code reviews do you do your own code reviews do you have a process in place um that kind of thing okay um and I'll review your answers in a second, but we're gonna move on. So uh, I had another slide on why we do code reviews. The first slide was more or less, um, you know, the benefits of it. And this is a slide of, well, why is it necessary in the first place? Um, and the answer is really, we're humans. Um, we write bugs, we make bugs. And, and my term bugs here is really very nebulous. It's very high level. It really just means the code did something that maybe someone didn't fully expect. And that is the kind of thing that, well, I mean, that could happen for any number of reasons. You know, maybe you made an assumption of how the software would work, or maybe you made an assumption in the requirements, or who knows, there's a whole plethora of reasons. But this is, in my terms, a bug. It's not doing exactly what we expect. And so I referenced this um, code complete book that someone else pulled some, some um, quotes from. And it basically says that for every thousand lines of code, you should expect 10 to 50 errors in that thousand lines of code. And so I kind of equated that to LabVIEW. I said, well, if I spent 40 hours writing code, I'd expect to at least spend one or two hours debugging and fixing it. And if I spend one or two hours fixing something, I, I could expect to spend another five minutes fixing that thing. So there is some diminishing return that if you keep reviewing the same code over and over again, yeah, there's going to be some loss. You know, you're, you, at some point, you've got to say it's good enough. We're not going to polish this turd forever. But that first initial go around, you're going to find a lot of problems and, and, and see benefits with that. Um, but then I also said performance reviews. I, we have yearly performance reviews where we um, just evaluate ourselves and, and have our boss evaluate us. And, and we have to say, how well did we do our goals that we were going towards that year? And you know, what skills am I lacking in? Where, where could I improve? And these are all things that also apply to doing code reviews. You know, it's, it should be a regular part of um, your employment process, in my opinion, just as a performance review is. Um, and then I see some of the comments saying that, um, yes, we do code reviews. Sometimes we do them sporadically. We only do code reviews uh, when I need help. Uh, we don't, the other LabVIEW developers mostly do one program style static machines. I totally get that if you want, you, you know, like, especially if it's a single developer, you're kind of like, why do a code review? I'm just going to write my own code. I'm going to have this whole project. It's done. Why, why involve other people in something that they don't have as much knowledge about as I do? Cause I wrote it. Okay. The process. So. When you do a code review, what do you do? That might be a question that's on your mind right now. You know, you're like, I, I, I want to have a code review. Great. What does that mean? And the real answer is it depends on what your needs are. Um, I'm going to give some examples of what I did and, and how they worked for us, you know, but that's not going to apply to everyone. We're, we're really on a, a, a sliding scale here. On the far side, you have, let's just let one person review their own code. There's no results, there's no anything. They can just look over their own code and say, that's good or not good. And then on the other end, I put in multi-team efforts and many endless meetings. And I, I heard a quote uh, that was, a conference is a gathering of people who can do nothing, but together can decide nothing can be done. And I wanted to change that a bit, but I get the, I get the same feeling about code reviews that you know, a meeting is where like, any individual person could get stuff done, but together, none of them can get things done. And I don't want that to be part of your process. I don't want endless meetings that go on forever. Your solution, it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. You're probably gonna adapt some things that work well, some things that don't. Um, but, my, uh, but my advice is to treat this like any other process. 
whether you got a document control plan or an FMEA or safety reviews or something, just have a process in place, document it and follow it. And if it doesn't work for you, if people are skipping steps in it, evaluate that. Maybe you need to change your process and then follow the new process. But you got to make sure you have the follow through. You know, I, I, I hate seeing processes that are put in place and a lot of effort goes into them and then they're just ignored. And there's there's multiple reasons why that might happen, but um, forcing yourself to go through the motions really helps. And and I'd really, you know, give that advice that if the process isn't working for you, update the process, don't just throw it away. Okay, so code review examples. I, I gave a couple saying you can do your own code review or you can have this multi-team effort. Um, what are some other things? Uh, so I have this rubber duck review at the top and, and that one is one of my favorites because it's so easy to do, everyone can do it. Um, this rubber duck debugging technique is really, uh, imagine you're describing your code to someone who doesn't understand your code or is unfamiliar with it. You're gonna go into some details about your code and how it works and the steps that it goes through. And as a result, you might find problems with your code just by explaining it to someone who doesn't know it. You're gonna see, oh wait, that doesn't work the way I expect. And for me, this happens all the time when I'm demoing my code. So I'll be showing someone my code. I'll be like, oh yeah, it does this and this, and look at how it does this, and then it breaks. And the reason, in my opinion, the reason I think that happens is because I'm doing that rubber duck debugging in real time. I'm kind of explaining it to them. And then of course I'm finding the problems. And that's a great first step. That's a great thing anyone can do at their desk. They don't need to document it. They don't need to whatever, it's just, I'm going through my code. Let me see if I can explain this to a duck. Okay, other things. Uh, there's a code review checklist, and I have an example of that that I will show later on, but it's a simple yes, no thing, um, basically saying, does your code do what I think it should? Uh, there's a VI analyzer. It runs tests on your code to highlight issues, and these are programmatically done, so there's no code execution. And again, I will have examples of that later on in the presentation. And uh, on top of having the analysis of your test, you could review that analysis with others, um, or you could just do it yourself. I mean, again, a single developer can run the VI analyzer on their code, find where their problems are, and fix them, and they don't really need to involve others. But I do like having reviews with others about the VI analyzer results, because you might understand why the VI analyzer failed, or benefits of doing it the way it suggests, or maybe reasons to ignore the VI analyzer results. And that all comes from shared knowledge between other engineers. Uh, there's the bookmark manager. I have a couple of examples of that um, as well. Very simple stuff that, that can be used for tracking reviews. Uh, scripting code, so you could have code that edits your LabVIEW code for you and applies certain things across the board. And that I kind of shy away from because I want the, the engineers and the developers to make the changes, not lab view all the time, but for certain things, you could just say, yeah, turn on separate compile code on all VIs. That's a scripting function that um, we could just do and, and not really have to worry about. Company style guides, cross-functional reviews, and my, my last thing to mention is that your solution will probably be uh, a conglomeration of all these different things in, in the way that you think it will work best for your company or your team. Okay, and um, not everyone's going to be a fan. <laughs> some, of, some of you might be uh, listening to me right now uh, and say, I think code reviews are stupid and they're a waste of time. And you know what? That's, that's a fine opinion. I, I can see that. It's just that in, in the cases I've seen code reviews done well, there's been a clear benefit. There's been a clear outcome that was a net positive. It just wasn't always measurable, and that's a hard thing for some managers to get. Um, so I put this quote at the top, um, which was during a code review of someone else's code who was very frustrated with the results and adamantly claiming that their uh, code was perfect, um, that they were calling this the opposite of a code review, and I sarcastically called it a code de-view. He did not take that very well. Um, but it, it's just, it's one of those things that a manager, if you really trust code reviews and you really want them to be part of your process, part of your culture, you just have to you have to get employees to buy into it and be involved with it. And that might mean taking their feedback and changing the processes needed. Um, 
I put down there an example that you might have code reviews be part of your performance review, which I, I, you know, I'm fine with that. Say you should be involved in so many code reviews per year and have that be tied to their uh, discretionary bonus even. Um, it's the kind of thing that if you really want, you, you might need to incentivize for those employees that are less on board. Um, yes, okay. So uh, Luis had a comment saying that as LabVIEW developers, for some reason, we don't have code reviews as part of our regular development process, where in uh, regular software teams is part of SPICE. Um, I'm not familiar with that acronym, Luis. Is that uh, a software team? Spice is, SPICE is basically the um, software development process that um it's that that it's that takes part of the auto industry uh, when uh, in any uh, product development uh, the, the process is called spice uh, it's mostly related to the V process model probably you you have heard about that uh, but we can replace the word of spice to process <laughs> to make it easier to understand okay thanks so um, one of the things I mentioned early on is the VI Analyzer, and it's an amazing toolkit. And uh, again, I'm going to have examples, but I have a couple of slides first, just showing what they are. And um, it, it is a, a static, it's, well, it's a toolkit by NI, first of all, for LabVIEW Professional. Um, and you'll find it in the Tools VI Analyzer uh, menu within LabVIEW. It, it, it performs static code analysis and, and does this using scripting and using tests that are developed by NI. Um, this is not a substitution for a proper code review. And my example for that is tests might pass, you might have no failures in the VI analyzer, but your program might not run. It might not do what you want. It, and that's the kind of thing that the VI analyzer can't check for. It can't check for functionality. It's not there for that. It's for the static code analysis, which doesn't go all the way as a code review, but it's a great way to augment this code review, to have something to look at, to have something to review with others. Additional tests can be uh, downloaded from here. Here's a list of community ones. Uh, these slides will be available afterwards as well, so you don't need to try and like print screen or figure out where that link is. Um, and uh, test, you can make your own tests. I've made a handful. Uh, it uses a scripting API built into LabVIEW. It's uh, super powerful and super useful for, for doing things. You're like, you know, find all objects that meet this condition. And then once they meet that condition, do they have this feature? If so, they may fail the test or they may pass the test or whatever. Uh, and there's also a nifty API. Uh, so you can actually run tests programmatically. And I've seen this taken to the extreme where on every commit, your code gets ran through the analysis. And if it fails, to pass the VI analyzer tests, it is rejected from source code control. And you know, I was like, well, that's, that's a bit extreme, but um, you know what? If that's the way you wanna go, that's the way you can go with this. Uh, other people have it as part of their build process so that they can um, you know, have it programmatically call this API and run the tests. Uh, they can look at regression over time. Um, and and you know, they have tools like Jenkins for doing um, release process stuff and being able to look at how your tests have changed over time. Um, it's it, very useful, very powerful. You can take it as far as you want, but the, the simpleness of it is also great for single developers. And that'll be my example more or less um, when in a couple of slides. And I just had a couple of screenshots here down at the bottom. These were the VI analyzer results from some example code that we were so graciously given. And um, I, I just wanted to show that the, the difference between custom tests and regular tests. So the regular tests, selecting all the default things that LabVIEW has, there was two high ranking failures. And then when I added a bunch of tests, we had 10 high ranking failures. Now each of those might not be like critical. They might not be like, oh, everything, you know, we need to stop the presses and we need to fix these. They might be relatively minor things and easy to fix things, but they just highlight the benefits of custom tests and being able to add or edit the tests that are built in. Bookmark usage. One more slide, I promise. Then we get to the demo. <laughs> bookmark. Uh, so you can go to View Bookmark Manager, and it'll scan your project and find bookmarks. And I'll show you examples of bookmarks, but it's basically any free 
uh, block diagram or front panel comment that starts with hashtag. So you say, you know, hash question or hash simplify. And um, I, I, this is used, the thing is it's, it's bookmarks aren't, there's not a set way to use them and not use them. So that's why developers are um, free to do whatever they want with them. There's no, there's no specific standard. So I made a tool called the bookmark um, dialog making tool. I can't remember the full name, um, but it, it's a it's a tool that goes in your tools menu that you can go tools bookmark dialog, and it says what kind of what kind of a bookmark do you want to make? You pick the one, and then all that does is put that text in your clipboard so that you can paste it. It's a relatively simple thing, but I wanted it to help developers create a standard set of bookmarks. Um, so I had a couple examples here saying question, you know, hashtag question, maybe this could be a place where the developer is asking questions that can be answered in the group, you know, and actually I saw one good example in Luis's example CLD code where he didn't know the answer to um, the requirement, like the requirement was unclear. And so he put in there a comment saying, I don't actually know what to do here. I know that my code will go to this case when this thing happens, but it's unclear to me how to handle it. So he could have put in that hashtag question. And then during a code review, we can review those questions and together come up with the answer or escalate it or whatever it may be. Um, I put in simplify saying the code is kind of overly complicated. Maybe there's a simpler way to do it. Hashtag reviewed, I said for places where the reviewer is reviewing your code. Um, I don't like reviewers to edit the code. And so I kind of put those hashtags in there to say like, this is where I think something should be changed. I don't think it's a reviewer's responsibility to make those changes. It's really on the developer. Um, you know, but you can disagree, you can do, you can check out the code and make the changes and maybe put in reviewed as places where the code was changed. Um, but my opinion is the reviewer puts in these hashtags saying, I think this should be fixed here, I think this should be fixed here. And then during the code review, all of those can be discussed saying, you know what, I put this in here saying to change this, but now you've given me better perspective and maybe I don't need to have that change. And then implemented could be a place where the, re the, the developer did make the changes the reviewer requested. Um, and I also mentioned QSID, which is a tool that helps generate documentation from bookmarks. I didn't go into it a lot, but it kind of seemed pretty neat where it could like generate documents with screenshots of all the code that goes into this. Um, one of the other questions, how many of these tools, VI Analyzer, Unit Test, Framework, Bookmarks exist in NXG? Does NI have a roadmap for if and when they will be implementing these? So um, I guess I'll take these one at a time. VI Analyzer, definitely not in NXG, but I know that the VI Analyzer is a tool that NI is very much interested in having. They use the VI Analyzer to review CLD and CLA tests, um, so they need this to, I mean, that's that's partially why the VI Analyzer was made, is so that NI could review other people's code. And um, that builds off of the scripting tools that are built into LabVIEW. And for those that don't know, scripting is uh, LabVIEW code that makes or edits or views LabVIEW code. So it's a programmatic um, interface. And uh, that also doesn't exist in NXG today. It's on NI's roadmap. I don't have a timeline, but, I know that it will come because they need it. It's not just the kind of thing that we as developers are asking NI for, NI knows that they need it as well. So um, while I don't have a timeline, um, I know the Anal BI Analyzer is not in there. The unit test framework um, likely relies on scripting as well. Bookmarks, I actually have not, I don't know the answer to because uh, I've never tried making a bookmark in NXG and I don't have it installed on this machine right now, so I can't test it but I don't remember hearing anything about it. So unfortunately, the answer is um, we're in a holding pattern for these tools, sorry. Okay, finally, 25 minutes in, let's look at some examples and some demos of the VI Analyzer. Um, oh, give me a second. So uh, let me just open LabVIEW. I got LabVIEW 2018, even though um, 29, uh, 2020 is out and it's a, a for community edition, you should check it out. I have a slide on that towards the end. But um, here is just tools, VI analyzer, and there's a bunch of things. 
um, why don't we analyze VIs? That's the most simple thing to do. And uh, there's a loading screen on my other monitor. So it says, what do you want to do? Do you want to analyze VIs or do you want to open a configuration? Now you guys at the start of this won't have a configuration saved. You're just starting out. So we're just going to say that. It says, okay, well, where are the VIs you want me to analyze? So I pick top level. I'm going to say code review, the example code. Uh, I like the car wash solution, current folder. And so it picks all the VIs and all the controls and all the everything recursively. Um, at the start of this, you saw there was a choice for uh, doing it based on a project as well. So you could pick a project and then save this config with that project. And then you can just say, run that config and that config knows to run it on that project. This is from scratch. And so that's why um, it, it doesn't have anything saved like that. So you say next. And then this is all the different tests that are involved. Um, I'm going to uncheck the user specified tests because these are additional ones that I added. And I really just want to show you guys what it would look like with a base um, run with all the tests that are included with LabVIEW. So um, we can see all these different tree categories of uh, different tests and all the different things that it's going to run. And with any one of them, we can click on it and get more details about it. So here is a test that checks to see the number of coercion dots on your block diagram. And it's saying maybe for a single wire, we allow a maximum of two coercion dots, which is kind of weird. Okay, for the whole block diagram, maybe we only allow 10. And maybe ignore it for variants or ignore it for classes because those are expected or whatever. These are settings that each test gets. So here, like enable debugging, it tells me what the test is. Um, and then fail if debugging is on or fail if it's off or I can uncheck it and we're not going to run that test at all. But for the example of this test, um, I'm going to uh, run the whole test with the default settings and then we can review the settings or review the results and all that. Uh, but my only point is there's a ton of tests in here, right? Here's a, a value property. Is there a wait in a while loop, uh, terminal sub diagram stuff? Um, adding array size, breakpoint detection, for loop error handling, documentation. Is there comments? Is there revision history? Is there spell check? I love this one because, well, as developers uh, and engineers, I think our, our English and reading and writing skills are subpar. And so for me, at least, I make spelling mistakes. And this is a great one to just say, see if there's spelling errors. Where do I check? Uh, on the VI information, the front panels, maybe I have URLs I'm checking or not checking, non-visible text, all kinds of cool stuff. VI documentation, is there a VI description? Should there be tip strips? Should there be control descriptions? This stuff goes on and on and on, and there is a ton of very good tests. And um, we're just gonna run the results and then look at it. But what you might realize already is that there's some tests in here that maybe you don't agree with, or maybe the settings on you don't agree with. And that is where we'll get into customizing what you want. Um, but for now, we're just going to say next. It says, here's the test we're going to run. Sure, go ahead. Do you want to save? Nah, just run it. And this will use that scripting interface that I mentioned, where it opens each VI, uh, runs each test one at a time, and then it'll be able to spit out results on um, how everything went. Luis was so gracious to give us three uh, CLD examples, and I ran the VI analyzer both with the default config and then with what I'm considering my custom config. And uh, the results for that and the example exams will be available uh, at the end. And usually the test doesn't take this long, so I'm getting a little concerned that things locked up. Oh, maybe there it goes. In my testing, this was like, less than a minute. So of course, when I'm demoing it, it'll take longer than I expect. OK, so here's the results window. And we can sort them by test or by VI. There are times that one might make sense and the other might. So here by VI, I can look at Oh, the car wash dot vi. Oh, I ran this on the main. That's why it took so long. Because I have two car washes and I have two of everything. Because these are sample. All right. Anyway. Um, or you can sort by test. 
And this is also useful because you can start to see things that happened often. Um, so here we have error handling enabled or disabled. We can open it up and it tells us which of the VIs failed. And then it gives us a nice description saying that uh, automatic error handling is enabled and it's not advised for code um, like this. The automatic error handler has its place, um, but I agree with the VI analyzer in this case in that the majority of code should not have automatic error handling on. So here we can see it, we double click, and you can't see on the other screen, but it brought it up and it said, hey, this has got it. And so what we can do is during a code review, we can go through some of the major hitters and um, walk through them with the developer and say, does this make sense? Does this not make sense? Maybe this test shouldn't be ran on this VI. Maybe this VI um, should be changed to, to have that kind of thing. Um, then they also have uh, varying degrees of severity. So you can see the exclamation point says it's a high ranking test and the I down at the bottom is a low ranking one. And we only had one failure of the high ranking. And again, I wouldn't even call this, I mean, it's high ranking, but it's not like high concern. And it's basically saying um, you have some unused code that you might want to get rid of. Let's see what that is. And when I brought it up, it highlighted this error tunnel. And what it's trying to say is, listen, you passed in this error wire and you did absolutely nothing with it. It was never used in here. It was never edited. It was never whatever. So the VI analyzer is actually suggesting that we do something like this. Instead of passing that in and doing nothing with it, maybe not even pass it in. And that's such a minor thing that, you know, I, I agree the VI, analy VI analyzer test, but at the same time, does it change functionality? Does it matter? No. So this is, a, this is a test that I could see fixing pretty quickly, or I could see the developer saying, I don't want to change that, and that's fine. And if they don't want to change it, and after a review, we agree that this is not a big deal, you can actually insert hashtag VIA underscore ignore, and then the name of the test. And so in this case, it was uh, unused code. And then we can tie it to that object that failed. And now if we run the test again, this hashtag VIA underscore ignore will tell the VI analyzer to ignore this test on this object. And so it won't fail this test anymore. I could have this um, disconnected and just floating. And now this will mean don't do the unused code on the entire VI, which at times could be useful um, because there are some tests that are on an entire VI, not on a specific object. So um, like the error handler, right? It said, hey, this doesn't have, this has um, error handling enabled. I could either fix it or I could say, comma, auto error handling enabled. And now it won't test that in this VI either. Um, I think starting in LabVIEW 2019, you can actually, um, you know, you double click and from here you can right click and say, insert VIA ignore and it'll in insert the ignore on this object for the test that it just failed. Um, but I'm in 2018, so I can't demonstrate that. But my only point is that there's a lot of tests in here that um, you might not agree with, and that might legitimately not apply to this VI. So that's why I made uh, a set of config that does um, a different set of tests. So let's not do this, let's do this. Let's close. Close, close, and actually I'm gonna close this too. Uh, no. So I uh, am going to tools, analyze VI. This dialog comes up. Instead, I have this load previous config and also sharing with this demo will be this VI analyzer test config. And just like before, it doesn't have a set of VIs that it analyzes. So I'm going to pick the example code, car wash solution. And now you can see some of these tests I disabled. So like tunnel position, um, for some reason, I didn't think that was applicable, but also some of these tests, you can change what the settings are and it will be saved with it. 
and I've added some new tests. Um, most of these are downloaded from the internet, um, but some of them I actually did develop myself. So I have a check here, like, is there a modal VI? Uh, for the most part, I don't want modal VIs uh, because of what they do. There's better ways to handle a VI being modal. Um, but maybe you disagree and you can uncheck that test. Um, but my point is here's a whole bunch of custom ones and a custom config that I think more closely resembles what a developer should be striving towards with their code. And I don't want to save and it runs. How am I doing on time? I think fine. Oh, that's what I always hate about PowerPoint. I stopped presenting, so the timer reset. Um, so earlier when I said I would be show, I'd be uh, providing the results for both the um, the exhaustive list and the simplified list of results. This is what I was talking about, where I have them um, with what I consider to be more closely related. Like there's a couple of tests that they did with um, code complexity, basically saying how complicated is your VI? If it's too complicated, it fails. And in my opinion, the threshold of what it thinks is complicated and not complicated was too stringent. So one of the settings I opened up was saying, well, allow for a bit more complicated of a VI um, because even the most basic state machine might fail their test saying, this is too complicated, make it simplified. And I thought that went too far. So here's uh, the same set of VIs, but now we fail a handful of other things. Uh, one is this check compiled code separation. Now, um, when Luis did this, uh, separating compiled code might not have been a standard. It might not have been something that we were interested in or it might not even been built into LabVIEW yet. So these VIs don't have separate compiled code on and they probably should. So this is an example where I would suggest during a code review for everyone to um, turn on separate compile code or even have a VI that edits all of them to do that. Ah, yes, thank you for the example that um, separate compile code, there is times when you wanna avoid using it. Um, and that is particularly in the test stand world or when you're doing um, dynamic VI calls to a VI that does, or to an, a system that doesn't have the ability to compile the VI, in which case you do wanna include separate compile code um, into that VI file. Otherwise you may have problems. Uh, yes, thank you. Also Tom. Well, then I would suggest you remove that test from yours or put in the VI analyzer ignore on the VIs that you do want separate compiled code to be off, if that makes sense. All right, um, let's see. And um, since I've eaten up already too much time, one of the things I'm gonna do is show the bookmark manager real quick. How about the, I don't remember which one. ATM machine, why not? So here's this ATM and I have view bookmark manager, uh, use the default bookmark manager. And then here is all these bookmarks that were left in place. Um, so I have one that I put in hashtag question where I said, hey, this is that question Luis was asking. I don't know how to handle this. That should be something he would have put in, you know, hashtag question. And now during a review, we can go over those questions. Um, but the other stuff is also useful. So I put in hashtag reviewed and then BRH my initials and we can go to any one of these and look at what I had to say. So here I said, um, enums should probably be type defs. This one is not, it's just a standard enum. And so in all the places that it's called, if you update one, you're gonna break a bunch of things. Um, just like the other uh, functional globals that we looked at, I think some functions should happen even during error. Uh, Luis's code here has, if error happens, then we do nothing. Well, maybe close or, um, uh, oh, this doesn't have any close functions. I saw the other uh, functional global had a close that wouldn't happen if an error was passed in. And I was just suggesting, hey, maybe we should do this. And that's the kind of thing that the VI analyzer can't necessarily detect. It can't know that, oh, there are certain things that do happen in here. And that's just something that a code review is, is going to have. 
Um, same here, I was asking about, should these be initialized? I realize the initial state takes care of them, but let's have a dialogue to figure out what's best. Uh, here, I said these labels should probably be transparent and then add the kind of arrows if you really want. Um, it's just better for visibility. Um, there's, there's comments littered all over the three projects that Luis gave. Um, oh, I was saying what happens here, we're searching for a pin and if one's not found, this will return the value of the last one. Is that really what we want? Is, should we have extra code here to detect what happens when something doesn't happen? Uh, here's the file IO, but we don't return an error. The error is inside it. So if an error happens, we don't know that it didn't happen. So I would suggest rewriting this with a simple function, uh, that uh, a sub VI that has those functions in it. These are the kind of things that come out during a code review that um, won't be detected through the VI analyzer. Okay, um, next slide. Uh, I had a basic checklist document and I'm not gonna go into details too much about it, but I'm going to share mine. And this is just a Word document that I whipped up that basically says, you know, what's the project name? When was it reviewed? Who was the developer? Who's the code reviewers? And then a handful of checks on things that should be there or shouldn't be there. So is this a state machine? Um, is the code easy to understand? Uh, does it appear modular? And if it fails, this isn't like, oh, it has to be rewritten or the code only goes on when it is checked. It's just a place where we can have a dialogue. We can have a discussion. Um, like here, uh, does the VI basically close when you hit the red X in the corner? No, there were plenty of places where that event wasn't handled. Should it be? I would argue in this case, it should. Um, here is it saying, does the UI resize gracefully? Well, no, but it doesn't need to. So maybe we don't care. Our right click menus configured for controls. No, does it need to? I don't know. Let's figure it out, that kind of thing. And then down at the bottom, I just have a section for general comments for you know, high level stuff. Sometimes the VI analyzer found, sometimes I found, um, but it's just a place for us to have a discussion on how things are. So um, let me talk about the process that I've used and you've probably already um, understood some of the, the steps that I've used because I've, I've went through some of these tools that, that we've implored and described how we did things. Um, but I just wanted to go into detail a little bit and then uh, you guys can adapt this process however you like. So for us, we said we would have a, two code reviews if it was basically high risk and we would only have one if it was relatively small. You might, you might do things differently, but the idea was we wanna at least have one early on for a junior engineer or someone who's never had a code review. And then we wanna have one later um, regardless, you know, maybe not when it's complete, but we want it close to the end. So the project starts, we get to a point where the code might run, it might not, it's got some structure to it. Um, these are kind of hard to do code reviews at 50% complete because you know it, it, it doesn't always do everything you want, but you want to you want to find problems early on. So the purpose is to kind of see where things are going. Um, and then at 80% or 90%, I changed it as well. Um, code could run in simulation or with actual hardware, but it should be you know more closely related to what we think is approaching the end. And then 100% you'll never get here, so don't worry about it. Um, code is never complete in my mind. It's just it's always getting better. Um, and so if you said, we'll have a code review at 100%, that's, that, try and not go for that. Just say, in your mind, is the code 80% there? Okay, let's have a review. And so what is the review? Well, again, these are the things that I've done, and that is to have at least three people involved. There's the developer, a lead reviewer, and one or more regular reviewers, basically, just a reviewer. Um, the, each reviewer, the lead reviewer and all the other reviewers will get a copy of the source code from source code control. They will fill out the review checklist on their own time um, because I don't want it to happen during the meeting is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, the lead developer will also do the same, but they will also scan the code with the VI analyzer. And then uh, lead reviewer will look for patterns and issues, um, mainly high priority ones. Basically, they need to come up with talking points about the code to have during a meeting, and then they'll schedule a meeting. Then in the meeting, um, each 
person, each reviewer will be able to chime in with basically the things that they found that uh, we want to talk about and discuss. And I put in here that we really need to highlight that we're not attacking the person. We're not attacking the individual or trying to criticize them. We're really trying to just get the code in a good place while not implying that the developer made bad choices or was a bad developer. This is, you know, we, we want this to be a free and inviting kind of environment. If it starts to be hostile, then we have all kinds of other problems that we have to deal with. Um, and as a developer, I don't want to do that. That's something managers usually have to handle. So um, then after all the comments and discussions come out and the VI analyzer results are provided, the developer then has to kind of evaluate how much time effort is needed to make these changes. Um, if they're short, I'd hope that they could just make those changes. But if it does look like it's going to be a long time, then they need to go back and decide, is this worth the effort? The, what were the results? And, and that back and forth. And, um, but the, the, the takeaways here, the things that I wanted to say is basically that, you know, the benefits are, uh, are, are great because we can sit down and discuss things. We can discuss options and choices in, in your development. And, you know, like I showed a couple of examples of Luis's code that, you know, I would have done this differently, or I would have changed this, but a lot of those are up to the developer's discretion. Some of them aren't. Some of them really are rules that we should stick by and say, actually, we should do it this way. Um, but but that's that's up to the discussion, um, and that's that's one of the the useful things that come out of it. Um, but just like the developer needs to be able to take criticism, the process is also open to criticism. Um, take feedback and adjust the process as needed, um, and and that's going to be a hard thing to to know, you know, when enough people complain about a thing that it should be changed. Um, and then uh, I've also shared scripting code to perform standard VI edits. Um, this is the one that I was saying, you know, earlier I made the suggestion that, oh, separate compile code from everything. And that's because I don't work in the test stand environment, but you're right. That's something that maybe shouldn't be done across the board. Um, but there are some things that like, you know, every, here's one I came across that was every, control should have a label and that label should not be blank and that label should not be the same as another control on that VI. And that's something that I'm hoping we can all agree. It's basically saying you should not have two variables with the same name. That won't be good. And the variable name should not be blank. And those are kind of standard edits that um, scripting code can go through and, and do for you. I have a handful of references here. Um, there's other presentations on the VI analyzer test, uh, doing code reviews. Um, uh, Chris Roebuck from uh, Conrad, he's got a presentation on YouTube that was very useful. Um, oh, uh, yeah. And, and so you guys are welcome to check out some of these things. And then one last thing I have is LabVIEW 2020 Community Edition. <laughs> It's it's unrelated to uh, the topic of the presentation, so I apologize for that. But I just had to put it in there somewhere. Uh, that LabVIEW 2020 Community Edition is out. It's free. It includes App Builder and the VI Analyzer, which ah, there is a tie-in to the presentation a little bit. Uh, it does include NXG with the web module, so you can go and check out NXG if you haven't yet. And, and you can deploy to Raspberry Pis and control Arduinos, and it comes with uh, uh, interfaces and TDMS improvements and all kinds of good stuff. Okay, so uh, I think I got it in under an hour. I'm probably at like 50 minutes. Is there any other questions, discussions? Uh, copy the presentation and the slides, absolutely. Um, I hate when people give presentations and they show cool code and then don't give it to you at the end of the presentation. So I am not, I'm never gonna do that. Every VI you see me show um, will be available at the, uh, uh, with the slides on the um, North Oakland LabVIEW user group page. I'll pre post it there with the slides, with the VIs, with the, with the test code that I use, with the VI analyzer tests that I added, those kinds of things. So this will be available for sure. Are you saying I, I've done this and not posted code? I'm not sure you're one of them. That <laughs> one of them. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're one of them. I know that Chris Roebuck, as referenced earlier, is one of them. He showed uh, some, I, I alluded to earlier, being able to run VI analyzer tests on code that you commit. 
and he showed some cool like integration with uh, the Project Explorer using um, Project Provider Framework. And I couldn't find that code anywhere. I suspect it's the kind of thing he is not sharing um, just because it looked like there was a lot of work that went into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are others for sure, but I am never going to do that. If you see me show code, it will be available. Cool. So uh, any other questions on uh, code reviews, how they went for you, how they didn't, things you disagreed with in my presentation, um, anything LabVIEW Community Edition, anything you guys want to talk about? Oh, thanks again, uh, Brian, for your time and your presentation. I think it was a great material. Um, yeah, I just, uh, um, yeah, I just have a question that the, probably uh, the rest of the group can answer, and that is one. Um, sometimes I, ha if I have a hard time uh, identifying when when should we start using uh, classes instead of clusters? And probably for some of you, it's, it's a very obvious answer. And I don't know if this question, it's uh, the, the good topic to, to ask this question, but I've always have, uh, you know, these small, uh, I don't know the word in English, but uh, when, when should we start considering OOP instead of a classic lab? Classic lab you when we uh, when 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 you review uh, a project. So um, this is definitely a difficult question to answer, and I do want to highlight that NXG makes this a little bit easier. Um, not that I'm an NXG developer, but and I recognize that people had this problem of knowing when to go from a cluster to a class, and because of that, um, they made that transition easier to do in NXG. Um, when you read and write. Um, elements in a cluster, you're using the property node essentially in uh, NXG. And so when you want to go to a class, it's that same function. It's basically just adding functionality to a class, or to, not to a class, to a cluster, which makes it a class. So um, I just wanted to mention that N NI recognized the issue and they've made it easier to have that escalation. But in current LabVIEW, it's, it's definitely sometimes difficult to recognize when uh, you should have that. And in my mind, in my mind, it's, it's more like, I don't know, it's a level of reuse, right? Like if I'm, making a, if I'm making a cluster and I type def it, that's usually like for that project. If I can see places where I could add functionality to that cluster and other projects would benefit, that's when I start to say, I should probably make this a class. And for me, that usually involves a rewrite because you're making these functions initially thinking, I have a cluster, I'm passing it into a sub VI, it'll do stuff to it. Um, and then later on you realize, oh, this should probably be a class. And then that's like, you know, that's, that's, it's not, it's not a, there's not an easy conversion process of like right click the cluster, turn it into a class and it imports all the functions. So um, it's definitely an effort, but I, I guess my advice would be, you know, do you envision this to work on other projects well or this cluster you made, does it really tie into things only for this project? And if so, then making that a class might not be beneficial. Not that you can't have just a class in, a, in one project alone, plenty of people do, um, but that, that would be my advice. Gotcha, got it, okay. Um, I did see a question or two come in about uh, the Lynx Toolkit uh, using Pi and Arduino. It's really super cool, and so you should download it. Uh, the LabVIEW Community Edition comes with links, and it does allow you to run VIs on the Pi, and that Pi can run headless, so you just, you know, you connect to it like any other target. It runs code. You can have that code run on first boot. It's, it's very cool. Um, the Arduino control, it has to be tethered to a computer. It doesn't compile down to something that runs natively, um, but it has its benefits. It is still cool to add I.O. to... Um, different stuff. And as mentioned, um, Michael Avalotis has a presentation that he did last week on VI shots that demos some of the functionality that Lynx has. Brian, have you um, seen anything that uh, in that with Lynx and the Pi that allows you to do a front panel? Um, so I've worked on a, a couple of things. Um, I know that's a big deficit for sure. Um, one of the things that I've worked on is uh, controlling a VI through a web page. 
And I wanted to deploy that to the Pi so that the Pi could basically be its own web page. It would be its own web server. Yeah. And so to control a VI that's running, you just need to have a browser on the Pi. Well, one is built in and go to local host, go to its own server. And then you would see the front panel in this web page to a VI that's running headless. Um, I had some issues with that. Uh, and, and I tried getting NI to fix some stuff during the beta and it didn't get fixed. So uh, there's still some deficits with that. But I think that that's what NI would suggest people do for now is they have a web interface that controls a VI because I mean, 2020 has um, WebSocket API built in and that's a pretty standard web technology. So you can write a web page that talks via WebSocket to a VI that's running. It's an extra step for sure. I mean, us as LabVIEW developers are just used to getting that front panel for free. And that's something that we don't get when we deploy to uh, a Pi, unfortunately. Yeah, I think they might have done that uh, to keep from uh, cluttering up the the front, the system, you know, or maybe from bogging down the Pi because Pi is, is it's a, a good little uh, computer, but uh, some things it might just be too much for it. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, the Pi 4 is very capable. Uh, you know, I, uh, as an experiment, I installed the full Windows 10 experience on the Pi and uh, it ran, you know, it wasn't terrible. Uh, there, there were things about it that weren't good, um, but I was able to make a LabVIEW EXE made to run on Windows and I could put that on my Pi and just run it. You know, it was a normal EXE with a front panel with all the stuff that goes with it. But that overhead of Windows and the compatibility layer for a 32-bit application, it, it made it so that it probably wouldn't be a solution for most people. Cool. My only point was that it is powerful. It can still do cool mm -hmm. stuff. Hey, Brian, do you know if, uh, if NI plans to continue uh, promoting the NI My Rio platform? Because with, you know, with the Community Edition and the Raspberry Pi and Arduino, I mean, comparing the cost of, of that platform with, uh, with the My Rio, it's definitely way more expensive, this one, uh, the, the, the My Rio compared to these low cost platforms. So I don't know what's the roadmap for, for those for that platform. Do you know anything about that? I asked and I specifically that same question um, when they were developing links and, and getting ready for this community edition push. And uh, their answer was pretty disappointing. Um, it sounds like it sounds like they are, are not making an effort to have my Rio be part of this whole links community thing. And I suspect part of it is that my Rio has um, a real time component and an FPGA component. Right. And those are both, you know, pretty expensive toolkits that NI leverages for their Serial platform. And I, I suspect that they don't want to have that be part of Community Edition. And that would mean not having the MyRio be part of Community Edition itself. Mm, okay. um, I, I do own a MyRio third party uh, or from somebody else. And it, uh, it's a little disappointing to know yeah, here's this community edition. It's great. However, to deploy to it, to deploy to the MyRio using it, you have to have the real time and an FPGA license on top of that. And that's like, all right, well, that just gets back to, uh, you know, professional edition for uh, a company. And the MyRio is not um, targeted towards industrial, it's targeted towards students. Right. Okay. Hi, I just had a quick comment. Uh, yeah. We don't really do code reviews because I'm mostly developing by myself, but uh, I do do uh, user interface reviews with the technicians usually. So just uh, I like to give them the program and see what they do instinctively first and then try to train them on it and uh, see how to make the user interface better. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I wish I would have put something like that in my presentation. Uh, you're right, having a demo, and especially since LabVIEW can make UIs relatively quick, you know, they're not usually as well flushed out as you'd like, but um, I've done that a few times where you just kind of throw a UI together and say, how would you like to interact with this? Would you like a right-click menu? Would you like a, a click and hold for something to pop up? Are you dragging and dropping? 
Um, that's great advice uh, to have a, a UI review before development gets too far along. Uh, sorry about that. So I, uh, I, <clears throat> I, I am, this is uh, completely not your uh, <clears throat> presentation related, but there were a number of people that uh, uh, directly came to the meeting without going through the, the order thing. So I don't have email addresses for them. If they would uh, send me their email address by private chat, I could uh, other, uh, could add them to the list so they get uh, an email next time we have a meeting. Yeah, I think some of them um, are from out of state for sure. So uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that in one of the meetings, but one person's already checked out or taken off, disconnected. Okay. Uh, let's see who was the one from. Yeah, Dan. Dan Bostich is from. Uh, he's still Phil, here. I, I invited Adriana so I can share with you her ah. email address. Okay, cool, cool. Sure. Yeah, she's the only one that dropped out so far that I can tell. Right. Good. We can do that. You can send me an email. That'd sure. be fine. Okay. Well, right, uh, so. if if there's no other questions, uh, that's it from me. Um, Bill, do you think that uh, in three months we're going to be having another Zoom meeting? Good Lord. Um, <laughs> I, I certainly hope we're not restricted to that. Uh, I would imagine that uh, we could incorporate Zoom into our meetings from now on. I mean, that, I don't see why not. That way, if people want to attend from other automotive uh, you know, areas of the United States or wherever they're, they're on the planet, they could attend and not have to, you know, get up in one of them aluminum tubes in the sky or magnesium tubes in the sky. Uh, so yeah. Delicious food from National Instruments. Uh, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm optimistic we'll be doing that in August. Okay. 